Hi and welcome to High School Physics Explained. Do you know what dispersion is? Well, dispersion you may or may not know as something to do with the spreading out of light. But if you aren't familiar with it, let's demonstrate dispersion. Here I have a light ray coming out of my Hodgson light box and this Hodgson light box is a common instrument found in many schools and it produces nice straight beams of light. And what we're going to do is we're going to place this perspex triangle in front of it. Now you will probably know that light bends or refracts as it passes through a transparent medium. But in the case of our triangular prism, the way that it bends towards the normal will be in one direction, but because of the angle on the other side, we're going to get it to refract in the other way as well. So as I put it in front of it, here I have my light refracting and it bends that direction. But if I continue the turning so that it refracts more and more, you will see something happening. You will see that the white light starts to become colorful. That is so the colors of the rainbow. In other words, we're finding that red refracts a little less than violet and all the other colors in between. And clearly there seems to be a relationship between the amount of refraction that occurs and the wavelength of the light. Well, that's what this video is all about. We're gonna explain dispersion. So here I have my triangular prism and we have light striking it at some sort of angle away from the normal. And of course the normal is going to be that line that is perpendicular to the surface. Now we know what normally happens with refraction and of course light refracts and it refracts towards the normal but red seems to refract a little less than let's say the other wavelengths which are much shorter. So here I've got the purple represented here. Now because this side here is not parallel here, what's going to happen is, is these of course will refract away from the normal but because the fact that this is not parallel what is going to happen is the dispersion which is the separating of these colors is going to continue and so we now have red bending the least and the purple or violet bending the most and of course I'm only using the two extremes of our color sp uh, spectrum and therefore you would have the whole range of colors here and of course that's what you saw in my demonstration. Now there are two aspects we need to examine if we're going to understand why this takes place. The first thing to discuss is the fact that the velocity of the light decreases. And that's going to happen when it enters something of a higher refractive index. Now the refractive index gives you the ratio of the drop in velocity. So for example, if the refractive index of this substance was 1.5, then the velocity inside the medium decreases by a factor of 1.5. So for example, if outside is three times 10 to the power of eight, we're going to have two by 10 to the power of eight over here. And of course, the velocity is going to increase when it leaves the medium as well. We need to briefly talk about that. Secondly, we need to look at why does it bend and why therefore does red bend a little less than let's say the purple and so forth. So we need to explore both aspects before we can get a fulsome understanding of why dispersion takes place. I will start here that I'm going to be talking briefly about the nature of electromagnetic radiation, which is what light is. It's a form of electromagnetic radiation, which means it's a transverse wave or fluctuating electric fields for starters. And it's going to be interacting with the substance. In this case, our substance is going to be glass. And so our refractive index here is going to be 1.5. But the actual features that I'm going to be discussing, I'm going to give fairly simplistically. There's a bit of quantum mechanics involved in a deeper understanding of what's going on. And really this is not the place for it, but I'm hoping to give you a little bit of an understanding as we go along. Let's first talk about why there is a drop in velocity. Well, if we have a uh, wave moving this way and we know this this is a transverse wave this is going to be my wave over here that's going to end up interacting with the material so my wave enters the material here but because this is an electric field that is going to cause the electrons within this substance which is our glass to respond that's the nature of an electric field. Electric field is going to cause 
our electrons to be affected. Now that means my electrons themselves will start to move and they will also produce a small electric field going in the opposite direction. They're going to go to have an electric field going in that direction simply because I'm moving the electric field due to my electromagnetic field. I'm therefore creating an electric field by the nature of the fact that electrons are affected. And these two waves here superimpose, they interfere with each other, which results in a wave that is actually going to be having a shorter wavelength. In other words, this here is the sum of this and this. And that means because we have a shorter wavelength, but the frequency outside is the same as the frequency inside, we're going to get our drop in velocity. Now, in other words, this is a sum total or interference effect of my wave. So my velocity here is, let's say, three by 10 to the power of eight, and my velocity here will be two by 10 to the power of eight. This also explains why the velocity then here returns back to three by 10 to the power of eight. And why? Well, because no longer, once this wave leaves, no longer is it interacting with electrons because we're in the material here and not in here. And so the velocity goes back up. And as a result, we are going to get back to our original speed. So that sort of makes sense. Why the velocity seems to increase here on the outside, and it's simply because we no longer have the interaction of the electric field with the electrons causing another electric field fluctuation or EMR and therefore cancelling out to some degree of what we had initially. So that deals why the velocity decreases in the material and therefore increases. Now, what about the second aspect? Again, I do stress that this is a concept that is uh, much more complex than what I'm going to be describing it, but it's in essence, help us to uh, understand it. So first of all, let's have our wave and it's arriving, let's say, at that angle. Now, of course, this is a fluctuating electric field. We therefore have an electric field that is going this way. Okay, so the electric field is going this way. If I were to draw my wave there, you would see my wave would be something like this. I'll draw, you can have something that sort of wave like that. Now, when this interacts here, again, we're going to get an interaction with the electrons in, we're going to get an alignment. And so that's going to affect, so to speak, the arrangement of the electrons in the material. Now that does two things, but to get to see what happens here is that when we have this component here of my electric field that has two components. It has a component that is in perpendicular to the, the surface and has of course a component parallel to the surface. Now we have two components, but what happens here is we're going to get let's say this one here, because of the interact, there's going to be an interaction with the electrons. This component is going to affect what happens to the electrons and the electrons will uh, shift a little bit. And so what we're going to get is we're going to get a vector that is parallel here is going to be still the same here, but this one here is going to be smaller because of the fact of the interactions with the electrons. So we're gonna have an a vector that looks like this. Now, when we add those two vectors together, we don't get this vector, we get a vector that looks like that. Now, if you then appreciate the fact that this vector here represents the electric field, the net electric field, then the direction of that is going to be, when we can look at that perpendicular, it's going to be in a direction that is going to look something like this. Now, it's not drawn as best as I can. If I move this to that position right here, you can see now that this particular line, this path of light has now shifted. And that's simply because of the perpendicular component of the electric field has been altered. And as a result, the light will now bend. Now, as I've established up here, the bending here is related to the refractive index angle. So if you remember that Snell's law says sine I over sine R 
is equal to n2 over n1, but that's also the relationship of the velocities and of course the relationship of the wavelengths. So we're going to get a bending, but if you're going to get a value of bending and it's going to be a particular value, then something that is of a longer wavelength, that'll have a less effect than something with a shorter wavelength. So for example, let's say I asked you to take a dollar away from you and you lose a dollar. In an analogy, if you had, let's say $10, you'd have still have $9 left over. And so you'd still have 90%. But if I took a dollar away from you and you had $5, then all of a sudden being having a shorter amount or a less amount, that becomes a 20% loss and you have 80% left because you now have four. And of course, if I were to push that to the extreme, if you had $2 and I took a dollar away from you, and then you've lost it by 50%. So what I'm saying is, is that if you have a smaller wavelength, then the net effect of these two things here is going to have a greater effect on the, sl on the slowing down and on the, uh, on the amount of bending that takes place. And so therefore, smaller wavelengths will bend more than long wavelengths. Blue bends more than red. Now, different substances will react differently, but that trend can be seen if we were to examine, let's say, the reactive indicus of substance, a number of substances. So here I have a particular graph which shows you number of substances and the amount of bending that occurs. Now you can see that silicon flint glass has a fairly high refractive index average, but you can see that there is quite a significant difference between the purple range and the red. Whereas fluorite, the difference is a little bit smaller. So it's not exactly the same for all substances, but nonetheless, you see that the greater the wavelength, the less it actually bends. Now, just one last thing and going back to my diagram over here, why do we not see this when it goes on the other side? Why do we not get dispersion? Well, the, fa the fact is, is that if this light continues on like so in that direction, we now have no longer this effect, that's going to cause this to bend in that direction. And if you know anything about refraction, that these two lines are parallel, which means now red will bend least, but as a result, because red is going to be initially going to be at the top here and the purple is going to be down the bottom here, is this, this is going to ultimately sort of semi-align here. And so it's not going to continue the spreading out over here. And so therefore you don't see dispersion. But the reality is, is even in a rectangular prism, there is some dispersion within the material, but it's just too difficult for us to see unless you have, let's say, a really, really, really big piece of glass or a pool, for example, and then you might see it at the end over here. Well, I hope that has helped you understand dispersion and I'm a little bit of a better uh, clarification on the nature of why refraction takes place. Well, I hope that helped you understand the concepts. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.